Dr. Levine, you cannot go any place, you can't turn on the radio, turn on the television, pick up a newspaper without hearing about H1N1, otherwise known uh, colloquially as the swine flu. What exactly is H1N1 and where did it come from? Well, um, H1N1 and the official name now for H1N1 is the 2009 H1N1 flu virus. Um, is an influenza virus. It's uh, like other influenza viruses that we have every year, like the seasonal flu. Um, it, one, one thing in particular, it's what we call a type A uh, influenza virus, influenza A virus. And uh, in terms of where it came from, it is uh, a, a new virus to people that is transmitted from one person to another person. And uh, when I say it's a new virus, what that means is, is that it's a new strain of influenza A, one that people across the world have never seen before and never experienced before. Uh, we initially called it the swine flu because some of the parts of the virus uh, were like those that we see in flu that affects swine. But what we've come to discover is that this is really not a flu virus that originated from swine or pigs, and so we really moved away from referring to it as swine flu. But it's brand new. People have not experienced it before last spring, and uh, our first cases seem to have originated from uh, south of the border and came in to Texas uh, in, uh, sometime during the spring. What are the uh, symptoms of H1N1? Well, uh, again, uh, because H1N1 is uh, a flu virus, the symptoms are very similar to what we see every year with seasonal flu. Uh, we do have something called a case definition, uh, which helps us uh, be more certain in our diagnosis that we are probably dealing with a case of influenza. And that's, that's really important to have that case definition of what we call an influenza-like illness because it guides how we treat people and how we manage people. And so uh, the most common symptom and one that's part of that case definition is fever, typically of sudden onset and usually uh, uh, greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, at least another symptom like cough or sore throat. And then there are a host of other symptoms that people might recognize as typically affecting uh, individuals who have flu, like nausea and vomiting, maybe diarrhea, a little headache, those sorts of things. But fever is what we call the hallmark symptom. And then uh, cough and sore throat uh, are typically uh, the other couple of symptoms that we see. You can also have things like uh, certainly runny nose. Again, the typical kinds of things that you might expect to see with flu. Is it true that it's easier to get the H1N1 uh, flu than the seasonal flu? And is it true that the symptoms are and the, the course of the disease is more severe? Well, let me, let's take each question uh, in turn. Uh, so the first question, um, is, is, it, uh, is it true that it's easier to get uh, H1N1 than seasonal flu? Well, I would say probably the answer to that right now is yes, because that's the flu that's going around. Uh, seasonal flu really hasn't struck just yet, meaning that we haven't seen a lot of cases of the typical seasonal flu. Right now, most of the cases that we are seeing in a widespread nature across the South and in Texas is the H1N1. So relatively speaking, right now, it is easier to get the H1N1 uh, flu. Uh, as far as severity is concerned, um, it, it, it's not as severe as we, it's not causing as severe uh, illness as we originally anticipated, but as the the uh, epidemic of flu is increasing again uh, in Texas during this time of year. We are seeing more severe cases uh, than, than we did originally in the spring. Well, doctor, how do I know if I have the H1N1 virus, uh, if I have H1N1 flu, or how do I know if a family member has the H1N1 flu? 
Well, um, as I mentioned, this is where something called the case definition re is really very important. Uh, uh, w uh, where when a person comes in uh, to the health care provider or to the doctor uh, and says that they have a certain group of symptoms that fit this case definition of an influenza-like illness, then we try to decide is that more likely or not to be the flu. Now we can do testing, various kinds of laboratory testing, uh, but uh, all of the tests that we do have limitations to them. And so really we should make our best determination uh, on what we see in the patient as to how we should manage that patient early on. Who's at risk of developing complications from H1N1? Well, there are, uh, that's a very good question uh, because it drives a lot of things, and there are a lot of, uh, or a number of different categories. Um, so uh, certainly uh, women who are pregnant or might become pregnant, um, as with uh, seasonal flu, uh, the very young and the very old, uh, but um, in, but but what, one of the things that we have seen from our experience thus far with this particular virus is that it, it does seem to be affecting the younger age group a little bit more uh, significantly. And so uh, in, that, in, in the age range anywhere from two to four years old, certainly up from six months uh, uh, up into the 20s is where most of the cases and some of the most severe cases uh, have occurred. So, so those are uh, really some of the uh, more at-risk groups. Another category I should mention are uh, individuals who uh, have underlying medical illnesses or medical problems or uh, who have underlying lung diseases, let's say a, a young child with asthma, or who have some form of immune suppression. Their immune system because of an underlying illness is not working as it should. Why do I have to get two flu shots this year? Well, um, that's, uh, what I, th that's partly a timing issue and partly a public health issue. Um, because the H1N1 uh, didn't begin to appear until the spring, uh, it appeared at a time when the annual seasonal influenza vaccine had already been well underway in terms of its production. And it's not just a matter of throwing in or adding in another virus into the vaccine preparation. Um, and so it was clear that what would be necessary would be in order to provide protection, public health protection for this new 2009 H1N1 virus, that a separate vaccine would have to be prepared and that the two would have to be administered um, during, the, during the, the, the fall season. So with that as a backdrop, what can I do, what can anyone do to protect himself or herself from getting sick? Well, that's probably the most important question because we really like to focus on prevention. We would just assume people not get the flu at all. Um, so there are a series of what we call non-pharmacologic interventions, and essentially what that means are, you know, non-medicinal kinds of approaches. Hand washing, uh, very important. What we call social distancing, keeping a, you know, a good distance between yourself and other folks. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is about six feet uh, from each other. Um, when you're in crowds or you have to go out in public, uh, try to do that at times when there are not large uh, concentrations of uh, people. Um, if you happen to be ill uh, or have a cough uh, or be sneezing, uh, to be sure you, that you do that into a tissue and dispose of the tissue or to use a sleeve, uh, that sort of thing if you have to. But again, some just basic principles to avoid um, spreading the disease. Very well. Doctor, thank you very much. My pleasure.